Hello everyone, this is Jonathan Little and today we're going to be reviewing a hand from a $2,500 event I recently played at Borgata in Atlantic City. So in this hand we have 9-5 suited on the button. Not exactly a premium hand, but a semi-loose passive player limps from early position. This player's been splashing around, generally just not playing well in my opinion, and he seems to... Just be one of these players who will go a little bit too far with his hands. But at the same time, he certainly seems competent. Um, we are playing 100-200. I have 25,000 chips to start the hand, and my opponents cover me. He limps from uh, middle position, and I have 9-5 suited on the button and decide to limp as well. I think raising is perfectly fine, but whenever you are playing against opponents, especially deep stacked, you have to ask yourself, where is my edge coming from? Where am I really going to exploit these players? And you're going to find... That against most amateur players, your large edge is going to come from either making them fold a lot on the turn and river, or by making them call a lot on the turn and the river, depending on your specific opponent. And as we're going to see in this hand, sometimes you can actually get the best of both worlds. So I decide to limp with the 9 5 suited. I'm keeping the stack to pot ratio very large. I want to be in scenarios where I can put a ton of money in when I have the best hand instead of just a small amount of money in proportion to the pot. So the pot's going to be very tiny going to the flop. We have 25,000 chips left to bet, and the pot's only 1,000. Um, I, I do think that you can, I'm not going to say blindly, but almost blindly raise the semi-loose passive players and then continuation bet the flop and pick up a small amount of equity. But we have to recognize, early in a tournament, if I win a 800-chip pot, maybe 60% of the time, it's not that big of a deal. It's not going to realistically help me build a stack. The way you build stacks early in tournaments is by stacking your opponent in big pots or by bluffing them in big pots. And you do that by um, you know, allowing allowing stuff to happen. And also, if I put in 200 chips, it's almost completely irrelevant. So I'm, I'm fine with this. I think that limping is fine. I think raising is also fine. Whatever you want to do. So flop comes... I guess both blinds come in as well. So flop comes queen of spades, seven of spades, six of clubs, giving me a gut shot, straight draw, and a flush draw which is great. Exactly what I'm hoping for. The semi-loose passive player bets 600 into the 1,000 chip pot. And at this point, I think calling or raising are fine options. I think, I think both are acceptable. If I call, I would like to have a pretty clear idea of how my opponent's going to react on a lot of turns. So you'll find that against some players, they will play very face up on the turn but against this particular player i don't think that's going to be the case we actually discussed this concept in ed webb and ed miller's um free excelling and no limit hold'em webinar the information paradigm where he discusses about how some players will just give you very clean information at specific points in the hand and if you figure out where those players give you the clean information you can just get to that point get the clean information, and then go from there. So say I knew this semi-loose passive player would continuation bet the flop or just bet the flop with a wide range, but then play very straightforwardly on the turn if, if he, I call him on the flop. Against a player like that, I think calling is a fantastic play because if he just checks the turn, I can bet and win the pot. And if he bets the turn, I can call and continue drawing. But I don't really think that is this type of player. I think this type of player we are against is the type of guy who we need to apply some aggression because if the draw comes in, he's not going to pay me off blindly. And also, I may be able to make him fold a large portion of his range just by raising the flop. So I like making it 1,600 here. I think that's a pretty nice play. I could also make it 1,800 or even, or even 2,000. So I do make it 1,600. Both blinds fold. And the semi-loose passive player calls. So when he calls, I tend to discount the very strong hands, like sets and two pairs. So that leaves him with a lot of one pair hands and draws. The turn is a 10 of hearts. And to my surprise, my opponent bets 600 into the 4,200 pot. He leads into me. You're going to find that when people bet very small like this, it's usually because they do not want to check and face a large bet. So knowing that, what does that mean about my opponent's range? I think that means he usually has a marginal one pair hand or maybe something like a weirdly played over pair, or maybe a weak two pair, like seven, six. Um, these are hands that he doesn't really want to check and let me bet large, because if he checks if he checks and I bet large, he's now in a pretty dicey spot, because the board is usually going to change on the river. But this 600 bet's actually a little bit bizarre. Usually when people have a hand like that, they bet something like 1,400. 
But this 600 bet is definitely not what I was expecting to see. So given I think the best hand my opponent can have here is two pair, and most likely just has a one pair hand, I think I want to go ahead and raise to a size that will hopefully make him fold out a lot of the marginal one pair hands, like 8-7, for example. So I do raise to 3,000. I could maybe even make it a little bit larger. The pot was... Uh, 4,800 after my opponent's 600 bet. So I think I could probably go a little bit larger here, but I do 3,000. And my opponent calls. So when he calls, now I'm thinking he has a queen most of the time, maybe a random two pair, uh, maybe a random hand like ace-10, and maybe even just a calling stationy hand like 8-7, or maybe 10-9, something like that, something kind of bizarre that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. River is a three of diamonds. And my opponent checks. So I have almost a nut low. <laughs> Whenever you have almost a nut low, bluffing should definitely be on your radar. So if I think my opponent has a queen or something like 7-6 or something like 8-7, is there an amount I can bet that ensures my opponent folds the vast majority of that range? So the pot's 10,000 and we have 20,000 left. My opponent has 30,000. He chipped up a little bit to start the hand. Um, this is a spot where I think if I bet something like 6,000, my opponent's going to look me up with all two pair and all queens, which I think is a large portion of his range. He is going to fold the 8-7, but I'm not even convinced that's in his range. So I think a bet of about 6,000 would be particularly poor against this opponent, which sort of implies that if I was value betting here, I would bet something like 6,000 because I think that's going to get called a lot. Like if I had... Um, Two pair of pocket aces, something like that, I would bet 6,000, hoping to get called by the worst hands. But against this opponent, I think he's not going to want to play a gigantic pot with his queen or two pair. So I think betting over the size of the pot is pretty sweet. So now I have to ask myself, if I bet 12,000 into the 10,000 pot, will my opponent fold most of that range I just listed, the queens and the two pairs? And I'm not entirely sure. I think he may find a hero call. What if I go all in? What if I bet all of my chips? Well, whenever you are running a bluff, you always have to ask yourself, how often does this bluff need to work for me to profit? And whenever you're betting two times the pot, your bluff needs to work 67% of the time for you to show a profit. The way you do the math is you take your bet, 20,000, and divide it by the size of the current pot plus your bet, which is 30,000. So 20,000 divided by 30,000 is 67% of the time. And I think whenever I go all in here, Assuming I have the read of my opponent right, this guy is going to fold very often, perhaps like 85 or 90% of the time. The only time I think he's going to hero call me is when he has two pair, and even then he might still find a fold. Because, really, a lot of players are going to look at this scenario and think that I have the obvious 9-8. I want to make this clear, that my hand, whenever I raise the flop and then raise the turn, looks a lot like 9-8 or set. Also notice that 5-4 got there, so the obvious straights on the flop... 9-8 and 5-4 both arrived by the river. That's, that's very important because I've played my hand as if it could be a draw or a very premium made hand. And my opponent has played his hand a lot like it is not a premium made hand. So what all this amounts to is that I think if I go all in here, this bet's going to work almost every time. I would be shocked if my opponent calls with anything worse than two pair. And even then, he may not even, ha he may not even call a two pair. So my opponent checks and I do make the all in bet. And again, like I said, a lot of people are deathly afraid to make these plays. They are high risk, and we are risking our whole stack. But you have to look at the alternatives, right? If I bet 6,000, I'm going to get called almost every time. So 6,000 is just an atrocious bet. If I bet less than 6,000, I'm probably going to get called a lot by this type of splashy player too. If you remember back to the previous few episodes of Weekly Poker Hand, there were spots where I was betting small on the river, thinking that my opponent was going to level himself into folding, thinking that I was obviously value betting. That is not this type of opponent I'm against. This is the type of guy who is splashy and just will randomly look you up whenever you bet small because, yeah, you know, you bet small. He's getting good odds. So against these guys, you really want to apply immense pressure and put them in horrible spots. So I do go all in. I think opponent's going to fold almost every time. And he actually thought for about half of a second and then folded. And he folded face up. He showed me 10-7 of diamonds, so he actually turned two pairs. So he called my flop raise with middle pair, which, like I said, I thought he was a splashy player. Um, obviously, he led into me on the turn and then called the raise, which is fine with the 10-7, but whenever I put him in the horrible spot by the river, we make him fold. So notice here, if I did get my flush on the river, 
I was going to bet an amount like 6000 and almost certainly get paid. And when I don't get my flush, I can go all in and steal the pot almost every time. So as you see, against these type of players who you can have a very good amount of control over and induce them to do what you want them to do, you can win these pots a gigantic portion of the time. And that's perfect. Whenever we get there, we win and we get paid. And whenever we miss, we steal the pot anyway. And this is exactly what you are looking for. These are the types of players you want to be seeing flops with and getting to these spots against. So that's going to be it for this episode of Weekly Poker Hand. Remember to check out my free webinar series for Excelling at No Limit Hold'em. Um, a lot of the concepts in, in this episode we discussed with Ed Miller in one of the previous free webinars. And we're going to be doing webinars with most of the authors of Excelling. So be sure to check that out. You can get it or you can sign up for the free webinars at holdembook.com slash live. There are also a lot of bonuses on that site for people who buy the book and also for people who have not bought the book. There's a free 16-page PDF available if you have never even taken a look at the book. The book is 500 pages long. It is a huge book, a gigantic project, and I am honored to be in the situation to bring you that book because, I mean, I learned a lot, a lot working on it, and I know that if you read it and study it, you will learn a lot from it today. And if you read and study it again in two years, you'll also learn many more things. It's one of these books that will continue to give knowledge because the book is deep. There's some information for amateur type players and also some incredibly advanced stuff in the book by some of the best players in the world. So be sure to check it out at holdembook.com. Thank you very much for being here with me for this episode of Weekly Poker Hand, and I'll talk to you next week.